In today's episodes, we're going to dedicate some time to discuss use cases in logistics where humanoids make sense and can be deployed. So stay with us and enjoy. Automation Awakenings, your weekly dose of best practices for logistics automation. Welcome to another episode of the Automation Awakenings podcast and welcome again to Mexico, Matthias Koblitz. Yeah, thank you, Oli. Quite hot in here and also very bright. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So you really need to use sunglasses, otherwise it's impossible to record an episode here. Yeah, that's right. But still, the vibes are great. Uh, the food is even better. And we have some really hot humanoid things to discuss today, Oli, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Because I hear from yeah many colleagues out there that humanoids seem to solve um, the ultimate automation dream. We can transport finally everything. Yeah, and that's something we want to challenge in today's episodes and walk the material flow in a classic warehouse or production site and discuss in which of these steps humanoid makes sense and maybe can already be deployed today. Yes, as you know, logistics people are very practical guys. Oh, yeah. So let's start from the beginning, from the inbound process. Classic, your truck arrives, there are some pallets inside. Yeah, can this be done by the humanoid? No. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Not the pallets, at least. Um, this is probably something that uh, mobile robots will cover in the future. Um, check out our episodes that we did on that. Um, but humanoids and pellets do not seem to go <laughs> together at the moment. Um, if we talk about cartons or parcel in a, in a container, however, it's already becoming more interesting. Yes, although I would really love to see a humanoid walking around the warehouse with a pellet jack. Yeah. Um, if, if you ask ChatGPT, it's going to create a picture for you. <laughs> but I think uh, that's not something that's going to happen uh, very soon. Um, we will rather see a device like uh, the Boston Dynamics Stretch driving into the container, um, you know, grabbing parcel or carton by carton and putting it on a conveyor belt that is transporting it out of the, out of the truck, out of the container um, to replace humans there. All right, so that means we have our first use case, picking off single boxes out of the container. Right. What happens now with the boxes? They go to a warehouse, to a shelf. Yeah. Humanoid or not? I don't think so at the moment. Um, in most of the cases, your shelves will be on different levels, right? So you will have like five, six, 10, whatever levels. Um, so if the humanoid is not inspector gadget and has like these, uh, extendable legs, nice. um, uh, it's not going to work there. So we're going to, we're going to see again, mobile robots handling that, that use case, um, maybe some fully automated VNA storage types that will cover it, but it's not something that humanoids are made for. Yes, although uh, Boston Dynamics Atlas can do parkour, I don't see him jumping um, from shelf to shelf with some boxes. No, <laughs> I don't think uh, I don't think he's made for that. You know, no. um, humanoids have other qualities. Um, they have to be really multitask able to really win against other technologies that are already out there that are more mature that are cheaper that are more accessible um and and that's why i mean just really bringing boxes into a into a storage right. is is something that uh, that is already covered by players like auto store like the power cube um you know with really smart really high density storage solutions you don't need you don't need humanoids for that Good. So nothing to see here. Um, let's continue. Um, I have my case that I need this boxes at the production line. Yeah, I think this will be in more interesting for humanoids. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it depends here again, if we talk about carton or if we talk about totes, like plastic totes. Yeah. 
And when we talk about toads, um, then for sure this is something that might be a solid use case for a humanoid. Um, so especially the, um, the delivery from a, say, milk run or some kind of vehicle that has transported the toads into the, um, into the shelf, like the, um, the supermarket area, the shelf area at the production line. Um, this is something where um, a humanoid could work well. And so we have Digit out on the market uh, by Agility Robotics, which is already deployed exactly in this use case, handling toads and basically um, yeah, transporting it from one, yeah, from one location into another. Yeah, and again here, to make it clear, I will not see a humanoid driving an actual tugger train to the warehouse and then um, picking boxes and, and bring them to a shelf. This will not be the case for, for a humanoid. Yeah? You need to change the complete setup here and um, yeah, deploy some proper um, AGVs that fit to, uh, to the use case. Uh, because you don't need this flexibility in right. this case, yeah. Right. And, and let's also mention that there is uh, high competition from the mobile robots uh, industry here. So we already have devices on the market that are doing exactly this. They basically collect toads into what they call a backpack. So yeah. you can basically put 20 to 24 of these boxes into this mobile robot and then deliver them to a specific uh, rack. That's the word I've been looking for the whole time. Uh, into a rack yeah. um, with, with with some kind of like um, ex yeah extendable uh, conveyor actually. Yeah, you know? that's not a humanoid then. So 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 yeah, probably it's gonna depend like uh, also on the on the environment and on the um, level of process complexity and standardization that is that is introduced into this facility. Um, with the mobile robots for sure being really, really serious competition wherever process standards are very high, shelves, sorry, racks, <laughs> yeah. racks look alike um, and, and, and yeah, the environment is simply very, very streamlined. All right, then we go towards the production line, the typical point of use provider, which is always a human nowadays. Here, I think we can really make use of the power of a humanoid. Uh, couldn't listen to you. This nice wind, this nice breeze oh, yes. coming from the ocean. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so nice. Sorry, Oli. <laughs> uh, just... Yeah, we need to cool down here a little bit because it's really getting hot. And it's also hot in, at the production line where right. the point of use provider even has to run around nowadays yeah, picking boxes, bringing them to the line, to the point of use. This is what he does. And here I see we can really implement humanoids finally. Yeah, yeah. So there is examples, early stage examples or testing that you can, uh, that you can mention. So for example, the um, yeah, uh, Mercedes car manufacturer is already um, testing the um, the name is um, Apollo by Aptronic, um, and it's a real humanoid. You would uh, picture it, you know, like with two legs, with two arms, with, with a head, and, and it's deployed there to like really, um, you know, um, take over production, um, yeah, production tasks. Um, by the way, also BMW is testing the same with um, the company called Figure, and they're, um, yeah, their humanoid called figure O2. Um, same or similar um, use case, um, really close to production, really, you know, like bring in like steel covers to the, the point of built in, so to say. Um, and that's totally something where humanoids might make a lot of sense. Yeah, and here I really see that we are finally closing one of the last puzzle pieces mm. in automation, the gap between yeah um, our warehouse and the production line, finally. Yeah, because this is where humanoids can play their strength. So if they're really versatile and um, like multi-usable, um, they also will be able to change tools to do different things 
um, and this is exactly where, where um, they thrive, so to say. Um, and that's why it's, it's actually not a surprise that, that we see those early tests here, especially with manufacturing um, companies that are into the automotive business, because you have very streamlined processes here, it's very predictive, um, you have a really very clear attack time as well. Yeah. Um, so so it's, a perfect, um, it's a perfect place actually to deploy a device like this. Um, and making it cover different uh, steps at the production line, because that's exactly also what a human does, right? It's not just like one, like one work step. In most of the cases, it's a bunch of work steps that this person is doing. Yes, after producing our goods, I'm just thinking about Finnish goods handling, um, dispatch areas, uh, warehouses, high racks, these are typical cases for our mobile robots colleagues. I, I don't see there any uh, humanoid anymore. Maybe mm. at a packaging station, mm. uh, pack it, yeah, packing cartons, gluing them, you know, this kind of stuff, yeah. uh, closing them. I mean, there are also uh, yeah, traditional um, robot solutions already available. The question is, do you really need um, limbs and a head and, yeah. and, and a moving um, yeah. or, or yeah, talking <laughs> a device uh, that packs your um, your stuff there. Um, I don't see that like really good cases where you need a full humanoid with with legs and limbs and arms yeah. and stuff. Yeah, I think there is a nice example here with uh, a humanoid called Reflex, right? Ah, yes. Um, and it's exactly. Um, it's exactly doing what you just described with the packaging yeah. uh, process. So today, also again, this is a multi-step thing. You have to fold, uh, open the carton. You have to glue it. Um, you have to glue the like the the bottom of it. You have to load it. Then you have to like close it, and you have to glue it again. Um, and and that's that's something that might also make sense. But for sure, this humanoid will not really need to move a lot. So probably it's going to stand on on a podest or on a skateboard, maybe on a, um, on a mobile robot basis, so to say, um, to, to do its job. So, so that might also be something where humanoids will be deployed to. Yeah, absolutely. Loading the trucks, same thing as in the inbound area. Pallets, for sure not done by humanoids. What about boxes? Can I use stretch to also load the truck? haven't seen that yet. Mm, me neither. It's unloading at the moment. Uh, yeah, I think we have to talk to the Boston Dynamics colleagues someday in a podcast, hopefully. Um, I haven't seen it yet. Maybe it's possible. But I think loading again is another, it's another type of complexity. You yeah. Know? So, so that's something that that uh, probably will need some time for um, evolution of technology and of, of solutions here. So I wouldn't see it in the first wave of humanoids and logistics. All right. So we arrived at uh, the truck and it's gone towards the customer. And I hope you liked our little yeah, guide through the uh, supply chain and where we can use humanoids in the future. I think a conclusion is that actually there are not so many cases, but the cases that do exist are super important to close the gaps that we currently have in automation. Perfect final words here, Oliver. <laughs> Nothing to be added from my side. The only thing is, um, yeah, that I hope, of course, uh, you're going to tune in next Monday for another episode again on humanoids, diving a bit more into hardware and software here to also get a view behind the scenes, so to say. And um, yeah, wish you a great rest of the day. Um, how do you say this in Spanish, Oli? Hasta luego. Yes, see you later, <laughs> see you. take care, and goodbye. Goodbye. This was another episode of the Automation Awakenings podcast. Visit us at automation-awakenings.com 